Let's look a little more closely at the boundaries on the page width table. Mathematicians often use the Greek letter, delta, to represent the smallest possible difference between two numbers. Capital delta looks like a triangle. For example, the smallest difference between two integers is 1. So for integers, delta equals 1. The smallest difference between dollars and cent variables is 1 cent. So for these variables, delta equals 0.01. The boundary test above the largest value in a domain is that value plus delta. The boundary test below the smallest value in a domain is that test minus delta. Here's a variation on the theme. Suppose that instead of specifying a domain by naming its largest value, like 56, you specify it by saying something like all values less than 50. In this case, 50 is outside the domain. Everything below 50 is in, but not 50. The largest value inside the domain is 50 minus delta. You'll see delta again in later slides. All you have to remember is that delta is the smallest difference possible for numbers of this type. So far, I've considered a very simple partitioning. In the page width example, there is one valid partition from 1 to 56. Everything else is invalid. But many variables have several valid partitions. For example, university students can earn grades. At Florida Tech, where I teach, a student who gets 90 or above receives an A. For 89, B. For 79, C. These are all valid partitions. Here's how to show tests in an equivalence class table when your variable has multiple valid partitions. It's pretty much the same as variables with just one valid partition. One of the early pioneers of software testing, Boris Beiser, often pointed out that testers who don't look at the code have no idea what the real partitions and boundaries of a program are. Here's an example of that problem. The chi-square probability distribution function is widely used in statistics. The function has different shapes. The shape is determined by the value of a shape parameter, which I label on this slide with the Greek letter nu. The graph shows different shapes for different values of nu. For most values of nu, it's impossible to calculate the exact value of chi-square. Instead, you have to approximate it. This is a common problem in statistical programming. Many of the most important functions can only be approximated. Now imagine testing a statistical program. It calculates an approximation for chi-square. How do you test how good that calculation is? The hidden boundary problem here is that there are different approximation formulas for different values of nu. So if we think along a dimension of values of nu, to test successfully, you have to test each of the formulas. This formula for these values of nu, this formula for these values of nu, this formula for these values of nu. Without access to the code, how do you know that the program has switched formulas, or when? I've illustrated this with formulas from a standard text compiled by Abramowitz and Stegen. Many people use these particular formulas. Other people use other approximations. The problem is still the same. If your function's programmer did follow a Bramowitz and Stegen, here's what you'd be dealing with. For nu greater than 100, the programmer would use Bramowitz and Stegen's formula 26.4.13. For nu of 30 plus delta to 100, the programmer would use 26.4.14. And for values of nu that are 30 or less, the programmer would use something else. Without looking at the code, how would you know that 30 and 100 are the magic boundaries? If you didn't know about these hidden internal boundaries, you might think that testing with a small value of nu and a large value of nu would be good enough. But in that case, you'd probably miss the middle range. You'd test with something that's a lot less than 30, you'd test with something that's a lot more than 100, and you'd miss the entire function from 30 to 100. If the implementation of that middle range function was broken, you'd never see it. And there are plenty of special cases in code. As with chi-square, they get put in to optimize the program's speed, and they're invisible to the external user and the black box tester. If you believe there might be hidden boundaries in the program you're testing, check with your programmers. It's time to take a closer look at the idea of equivalence. Now, we've already tested the page width field, but let's pretend that we hadn't run the tests yet. Let's pretend that we just knew that the maximum slide width was supposed to be 56 inches. Let's start by considering values that are too big. The program could have a bug in its error handling code. It could fail when it tries to cope with a value bigger than 56. Maybe it prints the wrong error message. There's a risk. Relative to that risk, every value bigger than 56 is equivalent. All of them will trigger the same failure, or none of them will. Relative to that risk, the risk that it can't deal with big numbers, every value bigger than 56 is part of the same equivalence class. But that isn't the only risk. 
the programmer might misspecify the boundary and accept 56.01 is valid. There's only one test that can demonstrate that error. The equivalence class of values that can demonstrate that error contains only one value, 56.01. So 56.01 belongs to two equivalence classes, one that contains all the numbers bigger than 56, and it's organized around the too big number risk, and the other that contains just 56.01 and is organized around the wrong boundary risk. So relative to one risk, 56.01 and 57 are equivalent. But relative to the other risk, 56.01 and 57 are not equivalent. Equivalence classes are always organized around a risk. Here's another example, the risk of an overflow. The program is designed to change values bigger than 56 to 56. I demonstrated that with 999. But what about 9999? We haven't tested that yet. More generally, how many digits is too many for the program to cope with? To keep the example simple, let's pretend the program is designed to cope gracefully with numbers up to five digits long. It'll do something else for anything bigger than that, like crash. In that case, 56.01 and 99999 are in the same equivalence class. They're both bigger than 56, and they're both within the five-digit limit. But 100,000 is too big for that class. So 56.01 and 100,000 are both in the same equivalence class. They're both bigger than 56, but they're not in the same equivalence class. 56.01 has fewer than five digits, and 100,000 has more. That's how equivalence classes work. Two values can be equivalent with respect to one risk, but not equivalent with respect to other risks. That prepares us to consider boundaries, or more precisely, best representatives. If you have an equivalence class, the best representative of that class to test is the one most likely to make the program fail. Those are often boundary values, but not always. Sometimes there are special cases to consider. We saw this with ASCII codes. The valid values were digits. Their codes are from 48 to 57, and everything else outside that range are not digits, so they're invalid. Well, except for the codes for space and minus sign and decimal point. Those are deep in the invalid range. They're not boundary values, they're special cases. But they're still okay with numeric values. You have to test them separately because the program has to have special code for each and every one of them. Another challenge for boundary analysis is that some equivalence classes have no boundaries. Let me introduce you to the concept of stratified sampling. Statisticians deal with populations that are hard to order all the time. If you want to estimate how a population is likely to vote, you don't call all 60 million voters. You can't. There's no time. So you partition the population into subsets. Statisticians call these subsets strata. And then after you've stratified the data, you sample from each stratum, each subset. It's just like equivalence classes. You don't have time to test all the possible values, so you partition them into subsets and you sample from each subset. The concept of stratification is more general than traditional equivalence class analysis because it deals with populations that are differentiated on many dimensions at the same time. For example, think about testing a program's compatibility with devices, like printers. You can't test a program with all the different kinds of printers and all the versions of all the drivers for those printers and all the options for those printers, like how much memory is in the printer. So instead, you have to organize printers into something like equivalence classes, and then you have to sample from those classes. But there's no natural ordering from those printers. They're inherently multi-attribute, multi-dimensional. That means you can't create boundary cases. The essence of the task is to look for vulnerabilities. It's risk-based. Start by thinking about how you group printers together into classes. If a bunch of printers are all designed to be compatible with one printer, say with one of Hewlett Packard's models, they all belong in the same equivalence class. That's what compatibility means. But some of these printers will handle memory less well. And if you think of risks, risks are potential failures, the printers that aren't very good at handling memory are the best representatives relative to the memory handling risks. Similarly, some printers are a little slower than others, or they're a little less well designed for timing problems. Relative to the timing related risks, the printers that are poorly designed for timing are going to be your best representatives. You need a clear ordering to have boundaries but you can find good representatives even when you don't have a clear ordering. 